Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, another episode of This Is Not Therapy Hour. Um, sorry, Brennan is finishing up his apple. Uh, just as we uh, went live, <laughs> he thought it would take a little longer than, <laughs> than it did. So. <laughs> so he's meeting there trying to uh, down his apple. So real fast. Usually it takes a second for it to go live when we click the button. Yeah. <laughs> so Hello, never everyone. Google, <laughs> never have trust and faith in anything. <laughs> um, welcome to the This Is Not Therapy Hour. I am Brandon Testers. I'm a licensed therapist, but this is not therapy for many, many reasons. With me, as always, is Cecil. Hello, Cecil. And uh, this hour, this live stream, is something we do weekly. Hello, my kids squatch. Um, where we just have an hour to chat about whatever. And every week we pick a theme in order to make it kind of easier for us to solicit questions and for people to jump in and know what they're getting into. But those of you who are here in chat, we're going to go wherever you want to go. Ask whatever questions, be part of the conversation. We'll go where we go. Cecil and I both have ADHD. We like to just go where things go. Um, yeah, it's live streamed. So, you know, be aware that it's public. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, we'll talk about what we talk about. And today the topic is, oh, sh should I mention that we work at a practice called Effective Artistry? Is that... Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I guess Where it's we there, do so. coaching and therapy. Um, our topic today is good distractions, which I had forgotten that we came we came up with it last week, right after the stream. We were talking about a lot of things, and I don't remember what the stream was about last week. Do you remember, Cecil? Yes, but I don't want to give you the answer. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, <laughs> But for whatever reason, distractions or things like that came up and I'm weird and I like words and we like to discuss philosophy and we were getting into things. So good distractions. We were having a conversation about even just the term distraction, actually, which means to draw away from. I like to look at roots and families and things like that. Because, of course, we we talk about, well, maybe we should talk about what distractions are in the first place and then we can talk about you know, the, the discourse around distractions. So like we've talked about a lot in the past, the brain doesn't really have a mechanism to reduce the amount of resources it's spending on noticing or thinking about a thing. Because to actively, to consciously try to manipulate what it is that is in awareness requires that you are aware of the thing. So, you know, the classic example of if we say no matter what, no matter what you do right now, don't think about a giant purple elephant that the first thing that everybody does is think about a purple elephant in some way or another, if it's just the words or whatever. And the more that you actively say, don't think about it, don't think about it, that's thinking about it, right? So there isn't a way to, to reduce how much you're paying attention to something. There are ways to increase how much you're paying attention to something. And because attention and awareness are finite resources, the more that we spend on thing X, Y, and Z, the less available there is for A and eventually things get bumped out, right? Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about distractions, generally what we're talking about, and of course this is gonna be very relevant for people with ADHD, um, but it'll be relevant for everyone to some extent and especially neurodivergent people. What we're talking about is for some reason that I am not aware of, other people are not aware of, that I can't explain, my pre-conscious attentional processes, those things which dictate what things enter into my awareness and what oh, things- that good old pre-conscious awareness. <laughs> yeah. um, for whatever reason, has admitted data, information into attention, into awareness that doesn't appear to be relevant to the task at hand. So if I say to somebody else, you're getting distracted, what I mean is you are paying attention to things that don't matter for what it is that we are trying to do or that you're trying to do or I think you should be doing. If I say about myself, I'm getting distracted, I mean that I'm paying attention to things that don't seem to be relevant to whatever it is I'm trying to accomplish. Is that fair enough? Yeah. Okay. And then focus is the flip side. Focus is a word that we usually use to mean that a majority of or a lot of or most of my resources are dedicated to this thing 
hyper focus really can be like almost all of my resources are dedicated to this thing and nothing else even exists in my awareness and how you know what you call one versus the other varies from person to person and task to task so we were talking last week about how it's interesting that we call it a distraction you know to draw away from because that's not what's actually happening right what's happening is that whatever it is that you're noticing there's something about it that your brain is deeming worth notice that it is notable and so it's drawing you to it not away from another thing but it does create less room for the other thing and of course you know like with many things we're going to talk about this when it's a problem right like if i'm doing something and something else catches my eye and what i was doing is not something that i'm worried about you know continuing or completing or whatever then I probably won't call it a distraction. I'll just say I you know, got bored of this and moved on to that or whatever other terminology. Distraction will usually mean whatever it is that I'm trying to do or that you're trying to do, we think is important and needs to be done. And we got to get that other stuff out of here. So I don't know, maybe that's split in hairs or a distinction without a difference to a lot of people. To me, it's a difference of these things aren't distractions, they're attractions. They're attracting you, they're pulling your attention, not pulling you away from just for whatever reason your brain thinks that it's important. Now, the flip side of distraction is innovation. If for whatever reason, it has been determined that, you know, the, the general kind of consensus, the public knowledge is for me to do this task, I need this data and anything else is irrelevant, extraneous. It doesn't help. Right. But my brain brings it in anyway, pays attention to it anyway. Well, if I don't utilize that data in solving whatever problem I'm trying to solve, then yeah, we call it a distraction. It decreased the space, the resources I had available for this thing. But if I utilize that information to solve the problem I'm trying to solve, then I've been creative, innovative. I've come up with something new by definition because I am using a piece of information that people generally say is not relevant to the task at hand. And I found a way that it became relevant. So it's new and it's different. That's not to say that people with ADHD are more creative. Creativity is a, a word that yeah. a lot of things in and of itself. Yeah. But it does mean to come up with new solutions, you do have to have access to new and different data. So we can't really know what information is valuable or not until it becomes valuable. Okay. Yes, it is also a distraction. Distraction is really just about what you're centering. If you're centering the quote unquote task at hand, then anything else, anything else you notice is a distraction. Anything else that takes any of your resources. But if you're centering, for example, the brain rather than the, the task, then what we're talking about is the brain is searching for data that it believes is relevant, important, helpful, valuable. And really, I know we've talked about intelligence a bunch in the past, and I'm sure that we'll talk about it more in the future, but probably not a lot today. But really, most of what we mean when we talk about intelligence is we all, our brains distinguish what data is valuable and what is not. And sometimes that's correct and sometimes it's not, right? Sometimes later we go through something where it's like, oh, this would have been helpful if I had noticed or remembered that other data. Of course, we can't ever have that experience because we didn't notice it or remember it. So how would we know that that data existed that would have helped us? And on the flip side, sometimes like trivia, I love like bar trivia nights, not that I've been to one in years, but because there's all kinds of things that my brain has said, this is valuable information. Let's keep this. Let's spend some resources on this. That just never comes up. But then at a trivia night, it does. And I'm like, yes, there's use in that. Like, it was valuable to hold on to this. But value can only be distinguished after the fact. We don't know what's going to be valuable later. We're doing our best and we're making our best guesses. The brain is making its best guesses. So it's not until you use a piece of information that you know it's valuable. And that really is a the flip side of we can't know what information we deemed invaluable, but actually would have been valuable. The other side is, okay, well, this information isn't valuable is always yet. I haven't utilized it yet. How do I know it won't be valuable at some point in the future? I know I think we get big and broad, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, attraction, distraction, it's really just about what thing we're referring to. Does it take resources is, is the point. It takes resources, which means that there are fewer resources available for other things. 
<laughs> I'm with you there. <laughs> I have a friend who just has a dictionary of trivia in his brain. Meanwhile, I can't remember what century the Battle of Sekigahara happened. I don't. I mean, know. everyone knows that. That's pretty common. But like, I don't think I pronounced <laughs> it right. So that's, that's there. You go. That's information that you have that I don't. Yeah. And I, for some reason, will always remember that Alan Young was the voice actor for Scrooge McDuck in the Mickey Mouse Kiss Christmas Carol. I don't know why. I remember seeing the credits, being curious about who the voice actor was, reading it, and now it's just in my brain forever. I don't know why. But I did answer a trivia question in seventh grade with that answer, and everyone was so impressed. So. <laughs> um, so I remember last week's stream was about... Um, uh, sensitivities oh, right, uh, right. and stuff of that and utilizing those to be like beneficial or whatever opposed to um like distracting us essentially and so that's why we talked about this one was like good distractions as like well what we're you know the idea was what's distracting us like how do we utilize that in a way to benefit us um and like you know creating an environment or cultivating an environment where like that's either no longer an issue or like what you said, like utilized in what we're doing at the moment. Right. Well, and, and Bast and Cider just made a great point saying that they can't remember when what century that battle was in and they've looked it up a million times and they can never remember. Well, part of the reason you can never remember is because your brain is correctly identifying, at least thus far, that it is not worth spending resources remembering what century that battle was, because as long as you remember the name of the battle and have access to the Internet, you can look it up. So I, I think I've done this exercise before on this stream, but I'll do it again. Just maybe there are new people, but it also helps make this point that what I'm going to do, Cecil hates this. You can tune out Cecil. Uh -huh. <laughs> about to do, it will freeze you. It will overload you in a sense. It's going to put you in that like spinning circle or blue screen or whatever you want to call it. Even though I'm saying it, even though you're now preparing for it and want it to not happen, <laughs> And are going to try, you know, some of you, maybe we did do this before and you know it, but here we go. Ready? <laughs> Thanks. 613-289-46. I did not notice what you were noticing, Kitch Watch, until you just pointed out. But yes, now I am noticing it too. Oh, all right. Let's uh, see. <laughs> the puppy's bill. Uh... <laughs> How that, oh, it's feathers blowing. Uh, so see what happened there. People got frozen and then I got distracted by Kid Squatch's comment. Uh, and maybe that frozen, maybe it was like, what am I supposed to be doing? What does Brandon want me to do? You know, like, am I supposed to remember these? But for many people, what happened just there was you very quickly identified based on the cadence and the fact that I was saying numbers and my tone of voice, oh, this is a phone number. And then once you have that, the brain stops paying attention to anything beyond that because we don't really need to remember phone numbers. If it mattered, I would tell it to you again or you could get it some other way. So you tune out. Yeah. But then I stop too short of 10 numbers, which is what you would need in order for it to be a phone number. So your brain all of a sudden panics and says, whoa, -oh, what did I miss? Because I tuned out. I thought I knew this was a phone number. It turns out it's not a phone number. What did I miss? And you're tapping into short-term auditory memory to remember the sounds, even though you didn't remember the like content of the sounds and et cetera, right? So our brains do identify what is worth remembering and what is not. This is part of why to-do lists and calendars, for example, can be helpful because if the brain believes that, okay, I don't need to remember this information. I just need to remember to check my to-do list or check my calendar because it's in there. Well, that frees up space because we are accurately understanding that we don't need to utilize, we don't need to hold it up here, we know where it is. On the flip side, and many of us have experienced this, if we start a new system and we, first of all, the brain's not gonna believe it right away. It's gonna be like, yeah, no, until you prove to me that I will you know, actually use this thing, I'm storing it up here anyway. So to-do lists and all other like offloading stuff is useless at first and in fact is a drain because you have to spend more of your time and energy creating it and it doesn't do anything for you. But if you do it enough consistently, then the brain will start to say like, oh yeah, I don't know what I've got tomorrow because it's in my calendar. I'll check my calendar if I need it. I don't know when the battle of Sekikahara was because if I need to know, I can look it up, right? But then if you do that and then you stop using the system, well, then it's even worse. It's like, 
crap, there's all this data I was supposed to access and I don't have it. And, and that it makes you not want to do more systems like that in the future. Because either in the past, it's never worked or it started to work. And then I stopped, which means I just kind of panicked because I lost a lot of data because I wrote it all down and then stopped using it. So one thing, especially that ADHD people will do a lot is come up with new systems constantly. I myself am one of these people like, no, no, we're going to use this system. We're going to use this system because it's novel. And and honestly, I kind of cycle back and forth now. It's like, okay, I'm going to use tasks board and then I'll use the post-its and then I'll use and just, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I forgot what the original question was. That, oh, oh, we were talking about no, uh, useful information because you did the whole number thing. I am so distracted by my background. Um, I always think like oh, I'm gonna adjust things because this is like my workstation slash sewing station. So there's like wigs and material and boas and stuff and things. And so like some of the comments have just I've just been so distracted by them. I'm just like oh god, I want to like put a green screen behind me, but um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, so sensitivity. Yeah, no. That once you explained that it was a boa. Well, okay, this is another great example. We're talking about matching sensation against perception sets. That's the process of perception. So there are things that we detect through sensory data, and the brain wants to match that against an existing what we call perception set, something that we already know and categorize. And so we're just looking for enough markers to identify it as something that we already know so that it's safe or non-problematic or whatever. And once we do that, it's gone. So... I'm looking at Cecil's background and nothing is jumping out at me as, you know, problematic or whatever until Kid Squatch uses language to guide my attention to what's up on the shelf. And especially because Kid Squatch, because she called it an animal, I was like, what the hell is that thing? It kind of does look like arms moving, but it's not in any kind of a way that I can understand. And it's drawing my focus. As soon as Cecil says it's a boa, and then my immediate response was, oh, it's feathers blowing in the you know air conditioning or wind or whatever as soon as i have enough to mark it as that my brain's like yep don't need to pay attention to it anymore yeah. because it's not a problem like a chameleon yeah mm -hmm. uh, but the other thing that um right there is a good a good a good do that now i can't say the word out loud it's um a bird person that holds up the space between heaven and earth so it's just a it's not a teapot. It's just an old that uh, is just a um, a little container, not a teapot though, unfortunately. So there, just to answer the questions, get out of the way. And uh, yes, yeah, Cecil lived in many different places growing up all over the world, and you know was exposed to many different cultures and has different artifacts from different pieces of that. Um, actually, you know, everyone's focused on Cecil's background. Let's talk about mine. I'm, no, I I do make a point of um, like the art on the back wall there. I do make a point of trying to get art that is close enough, familiar enough to be safe, to not like make people be like, what the hell is this? But unusual enough to draw the attention a little bit to say, I'm not sure what it is, but it it doesn't really matter to me that I don't know what it is. I know it's a picture, so I don't really need to know what it's a picture of because it does put you in a little bit of a different space <laughs> i don't have enough yeah. books it's true I don't, I don't really like collecting books i read the kindle these days for the past probably like 10 years most of my stuff is on kindle but i honestly just don't read many books yeah we're against reading here <laughs> high literacy <you> know? <laughs> um anyway give me on something like productive see so i'm feeling like a little scattered well we're like distracted um so like this is the thing that i wanted to talk about on this stream was like how do we utilize these distractions in a way that like can you know not be a like a problem like you know, last week we talked about the you know uh, sensory sensitivities and like like you know if you know if auditory sensitivity like create an environment where like that's you know works towards your benefit instead of against you and like, instead of being stressful it's beneficial like what about distractions in the same way it's like so you know we're trying to talk about this and i'm super distracted by my background um so like, how can we utilize that where, I mean, or can we, or what do we do about that? Like, sure. Well, so first, like the most generic practical advice here uh -huh. is yeah. 
when you start to notice a thing, when a thing is quote unquote distracting you, remember that there's something about it that your brain has deemed worth noticing and that you cannot shut it out. The more that you try, the more you will be spending your resources on that thing. <laughs> Wait, gave up on, oh, did we get, I think we might've gotten frozen there for a minute. Just comments about, welcome back. Um, like, sorry, the chat is super scattered, by which I mean I am super distracted, same. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's kind of, I guess, in, in a sense, inevitable with the conversation today. Apparently, we dropped and we're back. So we'll, I'll, I'll repeat a little bit there that um, should have oh, wow. we were gone. <laughs> we're just distracted <laughs> in our own little world here. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so we were talking about like what to do about distractions and how to utilize them. So I was saying that the first like most generic piece of practical advice is Remember that if your brain is paying attention to something, it has its reasons for that, even if it's wrong, even if you don't like it, and that you cannot, there's not a mechanism that allows you to stop paying attention to it or to notice it less. So it needs to be dealt with. And there are different ways to do that. Um, but generally, I would say explore it, meaning stop what you're doing, pause, you know, find a good stopping place where you can kind of hold that track in place for a minute and then go deal with the distraction. Maybe that means taking something out of the environment. I kind of half pay attention and half don't to chat, so that's a good read. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you know, addressing whatever problem needs to be addressed, um, or just, so here's a very common example for some people, at least anyway. Definitely it happens for me. A new thing is coming out, a new book, a new show, a new game, something that is, you know, there have been teasers put out and I'm intrigued. It's the new, you know, installment in a series that I already like, or there's something about what I've heard or seen about it that intrigues me. So, but I can't, I can't actually watch it or read it or play it because it's not out yet. So instead I just start thinking about it a lot. There's markers to my brain that it might be something I would enjoy, but not enough information to really figure out whether I would enjoy it or not. So I think about it and I'll go online and look and see what other people are saying about it and look at other, you know, like get other details about things and engage with the community and whatever. And then when it finally comes out, I'm so excited to watch it, to, to read it, to play it. And sometimes it lives up to everything that I thought it would be. And I, yeah, there have been times in my life where I woke up, started reading a book that I had set by my bed the night before when I fell asleep and just read until I fell back asleep that night, except for like going to the kitchen or the restroom, you know, like just 14 hours of reading. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes our, our markers were incorrect and we start, I find this especially with video games as I get older. I loved video games so much growing up and I still do, but I just, I don't have the time to play the kinds of games that I like, the kinds of games where you need to spend 40 to 60 hours within a relatively condensed period. Cause if you take a three month break, then coming back, you're like, wait, what was the yeah. story? So, oh, I read a ton, but we can talk about that later. Um, so that's what we're talking about. Exploring the distraction. The brain at first is just noticing enough markers to say, there's something over here worth paying attention to. And then when you go and look into it more deeply, explore it more deeply, experience it, it might become more clear why that thing was distracting you, that there is something that needs to be done, or it might become, okay, I've been wanting to play. There have been games where I have spent hours over the course of weeks, like looking at videos and finding out what class people recommend for things and whatever, you know, and then when I finally get a chance to play it, I play it for like 40 minutes. I'm like, yeah, no, I don't, I'm no longer interested in this thing. <laughs> but the longer that I delay that, the longer that I'm like, no, no, I can't play it. I can't play it. I can't buy it. I can't spend time, you know, then I'm still going to be kind of like trying to peek at it and spending those hours reading about things until I get to actually fully engage with it. So if you're getting distracted, a good default thing, if you can, is stop what you're doing, go explore the thing that is distracting you until it's resolved until you know what it is and you can put it away. Sometimes I talk about this as open files and closed files that when, when I become aware that someone is upset, that file opens. When I get resolution, either because they're no longer upset or because 
at least I understand why they are, whatever, I can close it and put it away and it's not taking up my resources anymore because I'm not trying to figure it out. This is why humans love to figure things out. We love resolution, completion, simplicity. We hate getting eight numbers of a 10 number phone number because then the brain's like, what am I, how am I supposed to handle this? Some of you might even still remember some of those numbers that I said, I don't because I knew it was made up, but some of you might. Um, so a lot of things here. Um, and Fritz, yeah, I agree with that. I do that too. I get like excited about something and then I uh, forget about it. Um, <laughs> and like, oh yeah, I wanted to see that. And then also like the comment about Baldur's Gate. Um, yes, you should play it. And the second one's really good. Well, there's the Probably third one now. <laughs> Fast Insider might be talking about the new, the third one. I mean, oh, I know yeah. they only released the first chapter or the prologue or whatever so far, but um, yeah. Well, <laughs> first, I have been there, and you can get it on the phone now. And I got it on my phone, and I still could not get myself to play it. It is such a commitment. And we're talking about yeah, ooh, doing things in order. If we have time, that's a good thing to come back to. Um, what we're talking about is is not unique to video games. This is something that happens to us all the time. It's like, okay, I gotta like organize the basement, you know, or whatever. But having so much there, it's like, I don't wanna start that when I can't finish it. Mm -hmm. I don't wanna like start developing an organization system and then forget what that organization system was by the time I revisit it. And so we'd spend a lot of time thinking about I got to come up with a perfect plan or the best time or the right way to approach this so that I can do it all at once. And until I come up with something like that, I'm just not going to start because I don't want to start and have to abandon my plan. So I'll just keep thinking. Yeah. And thinking is good, but you know, we've talked about the idea to beat our philosophy on how to know when it's time to stop thinking and start going with your flawed plan, which we can revisit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big projects. This is why the, both of these things are things that like neurodivergent people get this advice all the time, especially ADHD people. Write it down, chunk it up into smaller steps. And that stuff is all great and helpful. But when you come up to things that it doesn't help with, then we got to figure it out a little bit differently. But I feel like we're getting off of distractions. Maybe. So, like, let's say, so you said earlier that if it's a distraction, the best thing to kind of do is like uh, try to find some kind of resolve for it mm -hmm. um maybe it's like deal with it whatever else so let's say that like we're like in the stream for instance and now i want to go and download Baldur's Gate 2 to play it but i can't because um because everyone should start with that game and it's fine if you start with that game but Baldur's Gate is still good but um what do i do then to like get my mind off or like i need to focus on something like you know we all have jobs and we can't just engage in our wins so how do we like reprioritize that like do i offload it somewhere and then just trust that system works do i have to build a system to offload into it that i can trust over time to establish yeah, well, the history with or like what so, some version of things like that and there's not going to be anything perfect right like there's not going to be any way to like always be able to walk away and explore a thing and remember to come back you know things will still get lost this is why we talk about aims instead of goals um, which we've been doing a lot lately. It's not a binary, I succeeded or I failed. It's this is what I'm aiming for. Let's see what I can do that gets me closer and let's see what gets me further and, you know, keep yeah. fighting. Um, and Fast Insider is adding in kind of the same thing that, you know, getting worried that if I go investigate the thing that you'll have infinite attention for it and you'll never get back to the task at hand, which is a time sensitive task. Yeah, offloading is a thing. For sure, write it down. And maybe actually today would be a good time to talk about, especially after talking about sensitivities last week, different ways to offload because people mostly only know the ones that involve language and then audible alarms and things like that. Yeah. Um, so it's possible that that's true, that if you walk away and go explore it, that you'll find, ooh, there is a good reason that I was looking at this and it is a reason completely unrelated to what I was doing before. It's not gonna be helpful in that task and now I've lost track. So I, I have known many people who find a lot of help in the Pomodoro system. I personally don't like it and don't usually recommend it. Um, the Pomodoro system is like 
you work for a certain number of minutes and then you take a break for a certain number of minutes and you work for a certain number of minutes. I don't like trying to force my brain to, to like go for 20 minutes if it only went for five, you know, then what are the other 15 minutes? And then I'm feeling like I'm failing and yada, yada. Again, many people find a lot of help with it. I go the flip. My rule is you start the task and whatever that means, it could literally just be, I am thinking about the task. It could be, I've got to write this paper. Well, the first thing I need to do is turn on my computer and that is the thing, or it yeah. could be writing a single word or that, but some way you engage in the task. And then here are my rules. You can take breaks as frequently as you want for as long as you want. And as soon as you want, if I write one word and I'm like, uh, I'm thinking about this other thing, then you walk away. My only rule is as you walk away, you set a timer of some kind. And again, we'll talk about different sensitivities, but most people are going to use an auditory timer. Say, I want 20 minutes to go do this other thing that I'm doing. I want an hour or whatever. You set the timer. Then when the timer goes off, you have four choices. One, you get back to the original task. Two, you set a new timer. Three, you give up on the original task. You say, no, I'm just not going to do it. I intended to do it. I thought I would do it. Turns out I don't really care. I'd rather do this other thing. Four, you do none of those things, which, you know, is what most people start at, right? Like an intention to get back to a thing. I'm not giving up on it. I'm not scheduling it or setting a new timer and I'm not doing it right now. So it's just going to sit in there and stress me out, junk up my working memory, right? Time constraints. Yeah. So I'm getting, maybe I should try to ignore the chat more because I am getting so <laughs> Um Try to ignore, as I say, that you can't really do that. So actually, I'll practice what I preach and I'll, I'll read it real quick. We'll just have like dead air for like the time that we read. Also, like I read really slowly. So, so I'm always like, I'm glad that Brandon talks so much because I can stop there and be like, okay, sound out each word as I'm reading. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> no, actually, it's all you. <laughs> it's all useful. This is my point. Perfect example that what you guys are talking about right there is saying that this is not useful data and therefore is a distraction. I'm trying to do this. My brain wants to bring this into attention and it's not helpful at this. But that's only if I don't utilize that data for this purpose, which in this case, we already have explicitly stated, right, that whatever you guys say kind of shapes the conversation. So I've built it in there. But also then I use my creativity, my innovation, whatever you want to call it, to take these things like I'm doing right now, a comment that said I'm not saying anything useful and making it useful by tying it back to whatever it is that we're trying to do. We can't know what's useful or not until we use it or we don't. This is, <laughs> this is why I hate the way that most people think of intelligence, because what we're really saying is every brain distinguishes valuable and worth resources, not valuable. But then what we're trying to do is say as a trait, are you correct? Is your brain correct about what things are valuable and what things are not valuable? And there are so many other variables that go into that, into determining whether or not your brain was correct in identifying what was valuable or what was not. It's not a personality trait. It's not something that follows person from context to context. But anyway, we don't need to get super abstract um so yeah talk specifically working on an essay and waking up early and doing it you know there was a time a few months ago that cecil probably remembers where i would wake up at 4 a.m and get up and do work because i was so stressed about certain elements of what we were trying to do in our in our business practices right particularly in helping like take care of people and our staff and make sure everybody's getting paid a good amount and whatever and the more unsolvable a problem is, the more stressful it becomes because that case is open. And the more effort I spend, the more things I notice, the more I do, the bigger that file gets that's open and I need to close it even more and get it out of my head. So I'm looking for ways to kind of signify to myself that it is no longer worth what I'm doing, but I can't do that consciously unless I explore it, unless I figure it out and complete the task or figure out that it's not relevant. As long as it makes sense to me, it doesn't matter if other people might think it's still relevant. If I say like, well, no, actually I can skip this paper and still get an A, so I'll just let it go. And other people might be like, no, no, you still got to do it. doesn't matter as long as I believe it. 
Um, and yes, what you're talking about there is your brain. So Bass Insider is saying, you know, waking up at six and it's due at 11, they'll stress out about 11. This is actually, here's another like thing that people commonly point at as signs of neurodivergence is, do you have echolalia, you know, repeat sounds? Excuse me, do you pick up on accents and dialects easily or maybe even without noticing that you start copying other people's speech patterns? Because when people are talking, usually what we kind of collectively identify as the important information about that is the content of what they're trying to get across to you. So most people's brains don't pay attention to the specific, how did they pronounce the R in that word, right? But some of us, for some reason, our brains are like, no, no, I've got to listen to like everything about the tone and the pronunciation and whatever. And we start picking it up. And the more we focus on that, the more of our resources go to that, the more it starts to just replicate without us being intentional about that. So for some reason, your brain is focusing on the due date and is taking up a lot of room in there, the time. And then the actual doing of the thing has less room available to it to, to use for that, less fewer resources available for that. Because a bunch of it is just going to OS 11. And the example, again, everybody's had this one. Okay, if I fall asleep now, I'll get eight hours of sleep. If I fall asleep now, I'll get seven. Crap, if I fall asleep now, I'll get six and a half. For some reason, our brain is focused on that particular piece of data to the point that it is detrimental to accomplishing the task that we're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And by the way, when that happens, my advice is the same. Get out of bed and go do something else that will pull your attention off of what time it is and how much time you have available to sleep. This is good distractions, right? Good distractions result in creativity, but good distractions is also when you have come across something that your brain, I, I think we've said this before, that we define a problem as something of which I am presently aware that is different than I want it to be. Really, we mean that my perception of what it is is that it's different than I want it to be, but everything is filtered through perception. So we can solve that problem, meaning decrease the extent to which it is a problem, potentially even eliminate it altogether by changing any one or more of those variables. One of that means if I can become less aware for some reason of this thing that I don't like, then it will stop being a problem. And again, classic and universal example, the existentialists will love the fear of death. Nobody wants to die. Obviously, there are you know, exceptions to this rule, but even in those cases, it's more about escaping other things rather than, at least as far as we can tell. Obviously, we can't ask people who complete that act, but people who don't. Um, that it is built into us biologically to, to want to continue to live, right? That's what our bodies are built for, right? We're not going to be able to change it. Everyone's going to die. We know that. So what is, is that I will die. What I want is that I don't want to die, but I cannot resolve those two things. So the third variable is how aware of it am I in the present moment? And most of us just don't think about that most of the time. And anything that happens that brings it into our awareness, we do not like. If somebody swerves in front of me and for a moment I think I might die, like that is panic mode. If someone I'm close to passes away and reminds me about mortality. You know, if I'm looking at a dead body, if I'm thinking these things that bring it into my awareness, make it more of a problem for me. I'm not saying that it's not a problem for other people, even whether, you know, regardless of whether I'm paying attention to it or not. Yeah. And there are things that we can know and have in our long-term memory, like the fact that we will all die that are not present in our awareness every moment to moment. So procrastination in this sense is solving the problem by making yourself be less aware of it, usually by going to find other types of data that your brain prioritizes more so that it just kind of bumps out whatever it is that you're aware of. So if you don't like the procrastination, then you got to focus on those other two pieces. What can I do? What can be done in order to bring this thing closer to what I want it to be? Or what can be done to bring what I want closer to what is otherwise you're going to keep coming back to it's not worth thinking about there's nothing i can do about it which by the way if anybody ever tells you for any reason whatever justification they use to say yeah this thing sucks i don't like it but i don't want to think about it there's nothing i can do about it 
and your response to that is to try and argue them out of it and say, no, no, you can do plenty. They're not going to like it because <laughs> all you're really doing is saying, you should think about this thing. You should think about the fact that you're going to die. It's like, no, I don't like that experience. And I don't think there's anything I can do about it. Obviously, there are things we can do in particular contexts, right? I have lost track of the chat for a while here, so I don't know where we're at now. Uh, um, this, is, this idea me because I'm like, oh, but uh, it's a little more than that. But um, I like how we were talking about like good distractions and then talked about the futility of life and thinking about death. <laughs> it's like, that was a nice subtle shift over in distraction. Well, you know, if we wanted to be real morose about it, we could just say life is just one big distraction from death, right? I mean, yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. And so, see, good distraction, people. <laughs> well, that is one way that distractions can be good. We've talked about this, especially when we were talking about anxiety and people were bringing up bigger, like, existential problems, like, you know, death or climate change or, you know, things that I don't like, but I don't think I can do anything about or that whatever it is that I can do about it doesn't appear to be worth my resources to spend all that to do that. And it only has this impact. Mm -hmm. And the answer, yeah, is you've got to be less aware of it, which only happens by engaging more with the things that your brain prioritizes more than whatever that is. But for some reason, not for some reason, I mean, of course, I've got theories, but especially in our culture, we, we tend to um lionize suffering we make it into a noble thing that those who are willing to suffer most are the best right and you know i'm not trying to take anything away from anybody but what i would say is that suffering in and of itself is not valuable we often get valuable things out of experiences that involve suffering but if we could have gotten those same things out of experiences that didn't involve suffering wouldn't that have been better you know, so there does tend to be this thing of like, well, I shouldn't stop paying attention to this, even though I believe there's nothing I can do about it, even though I don't like it, even though I can't change it, I should still spend my resources on it. And and I get that there's there is a nobility in that kind of narrative. But here's the other part. Well, what is it that's not being done that you could have done with those resources? If you weren't just doom scrolling Twitter all day, every day kind of thing, you know, like what else might you be able to do instead? Is it yeah. really beneficial to quote unquote, be informed if that information doesn't result in any action, just a feeling of overwhelm. So good distraction. Yeah, go. And then this is, I, I don't remember, but probably where we got to it from sensitivities is we remember we were talking about sensitivities as things that your brain appears to prioritize for attention and awareness disproportionate to any reason that you can understand for prioritizing that data. Mm -hmm. I am noticing these sounds, this thing, you know, even though I don't need to, I'm noticing this smell, even though it's not, you know, I already have the data. I don't need to continuously have a big chunk of my awareness on it. So you use that. If you know that you prioritize auditory data, social data, receptive language, visual, tactile, whatever category you can come up with, then use that. Use those as good distractions. Yeah. I mean, I think there's that like the idea of, of so, so like a very like, um, like I said, like, I don't know, just, holistic approach whatever is to think of these distractions as less of a like an obstacle and more of a i don't know just part of the weave i don't know does that make sense it does I, yeah i like that and and remember we cannot in the moment know what information is valuable or not when i when i for some reason paid attention to the fact that alan young was the voice of scrooge mcduck i did not know that my seventh grade teacher would do a trivia game and ask that question, but then it happened later. And does that shift everyone's perception of me? Yeah. Is that in a good way or bad? I don't know, but it definitely changes how they perceive me. Makes them think I have like all kinds of weird mystical knowledge just sitting in my head. <laughs> uh, but how would we know in the moment? We don't know. So I'm not saying trust your brain because sometimes we're wrong, you know, 
but I'm saying that you don't really have another choice. <laughs> if you're noticing it, you're noticing it. So you either get rid of it, resolve it, or engage with it until you get what you need from it. But like ignoring it and fighting it is obviously not helpful and in fact counterintuitive or counter um counterproductive. Counterproductive, thank you. Yeah, you're spending it's more counter strike, but it's like that's a game and <laughs> like <laughs> magic weave. Yeah, I we are seeing one place. of these days <laughs> we'll talk about my theories on magic and stuff, but some other yeah. time. We are in the spell plague, I mean, because it explains so much. <laughs> Um, I was thinking characters. of the Wheel of Time weave more than the Forgotten mm -hmm. Realms, but um, my last yeah, so, character was based off of like the spell playing stuff, but it's a different. <laughs> it's a whole thing to itself. So practical <laughs> advice: take break, step away, engage with your distraction, make lists of your distractions, menus, especially if you get emotionally dysregulated. You know, if you know this about yourself, make options, menus, lists of things that tend to quote unquote distract you so that when you want to get off of what you're thinking about, you can utilize that at will. Ooh, this like is that. part of what we talk about when we say having different physical space, right? Because it, mm -hmm. I want my bedroom, for example, to be full of things that I love that pull my attention, you know, that that are interesting and safe and comfortable and that I just like. I don't want my office full of things like that because then it's harder to filter all that out. It takes more resources. So instead I fill my office with things that I still like, but that guide and shape my attention in that way. Oh, we just, uh, we finished. Yeah, we've been into Avernus. It's been about a year <laughs> since we finished Descent into Avernus. <laughs> Sorry, there's a comment about that. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm so distracting today as well. And Here, let me give this example. So Aaron, who we've mentioned before, is a, a painter, a visual artist who has ADHD. He's one of our coaches, brilliant guy, awesome. Uh, and at one point he started experimenting with, he was, he was painting a human figure, right? And going for something that wasn't exactly photorealistic, but you know, more towards the realism end than the impressionistic, you know, abstract end. And he noticed that he kept, you know, wanting to focus on this part of the body, thinking, ah, I gotta get to the hand, but just never really wanting to, never really wanting to like bring it into more, you know, sharp detail or whatever. And finally decided, let himself say, you know what? I'm not gonna make myself bring that hand into more focus. That that in a sense, it's him letting his ADHD into his art because that's how he sees the world. Some things he notices in great detail and clarity and some things he notices just enough that they're fuzzy. And so by shifting how he's thinking about his art and his process away from it must be done this way to this is the way that I do it and building it off of that, I think it creates a really kind of cool, yeah, abstract art is super valid. I love abstract art. Um, that I think that's pretty cool that, that, you know, he's sharing not just what would this thing look like visually, you know, in a, in a fairly like high fidelity replication kind of a way, mm -hmm. but more, what is my experience of this thing, which I guess, you know, that's what impressionism is. I just like that. It was like, I really want to do this part. I don't want to do that part. So I let myself. A lot of what we struggle with as neurodivergent people is that we identify or things are identified for us as the correct way. Mm -hmm. We spend so much of our resources trying to get ourselves to do it in that way, when much of that would be better accomplished, more efficiently accomplished, if we just looked at what it is that we already do and lean into that. That if you work best when it's 2 a.m. and everybody else is asleep, that you do the best you can to build your schedule so that you can work at 2 a.m. instead of trying to make yourself work at 5 p.m. or 10 a.m. or whatever. Of course, there are limits to all of that. Yeah. We want to get as close as we can. So that's good distractions. We can like them. We cannot like them. Here's another way of looking at it is we can acknowledge the reality of what is without applying a value judgment to it. What exists and whether you wish it were different are two different things. And people struggle with that a lot of the time, struggle with acknowledging like, no, I am mad at you. 
even though I don't want to be, and I don't like that I am, you know, so I, I won't acknowledge it. I won't say it to you because I don't want you to feel like I'm mad at you because I don't want that. But that doesn't always accomplish what we're wanting it to accomplish, right? Especially for in this example, if the other person is aware that you're mad or believes that you're mad at them by refusing to acknowledge it, you're making it probably worse for both of you. There's a reason that we communicate about things, good things, bad things, whatever. Mm -hmm. There's a reason we communicate about things. And so if we hold back on that because, you know, no one's, this art isn't good enough for people to see, or these things that I'm feeling I shouldn't be feeling, or mm -hmm. that truth that I know to be true, you know, that I know to be <laughs> accurate is unpleasant. So why bring it up? In fact, a lot of people are dealing with that right now with, COVID, right? That there are things happening that I'm going to guess nobody likes. Certainly I don't. Yeah. To acknowledge this is what it is. And then we can deal with whether we like it or not or what to do about it separately. Well, here's a good question. Uh, do you have any recommendations uh, for acknowledging and like dismissing things that are like black hole distractions in the day to day workspace? Um, yeah, well, so it depends on the specifics. And if you want to give any specifics in the public forum, I'm happy to, to touch on that. But a lot of this goes back to what Cecil was saying earlier, like, is it about having a system and et cetera? So first of all, if there's something in the environment that is a black hole distraction, get up and remove it from the environment. Now, you can't always do that, you know, shared workspaces and whatever. So if you can't do that, or if it's not something that is coming from the environment, if it's just a, I keep thinking about this, you know, date I've got coming up tomorrow or this fight I had yesterday or whatever, right? Then, yeah, we want to like explore it and still that same thing. Okay, I'm going to give myself 20 minutes, 20 minute thing to sit there and think about it. Now, if it's that abstract thing, it's not coming from the environment, then I would always recommend doing something with that, whether that's talking out loud, writing it down, or oh, I said we would touch on this before. It doesn't have to be language. If you are a visual artist, if you know that you're responsive to visual data, then sketch something, draw something, you know, take colors and just make lines of things, whatever. It doesn't matter as long as you are able to connect what it is that you're doing to the meaning that's in your head, then you'll be able to explore it and manipulate it in different ways. So you set your timer, do something like that. And then when the timer goes, you either set a new timer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm not sure how to live right. I'm incredibly talented at finding distractions. Yeah, well, your brain, sometimes I talk about it as wide versus deep attention, where wide attention, if we just throw a number on it, like I can pay attention to 100 things, 100 bits of data per moment, and I can store in awareness a 1,000 bits of data at a time, right? That wide attention is I'm getting one bit of data off of 100 different things, and deep attention is I'm getting 100 bits of data about one thing. I'm thinking very deeply about this one thing. So some people, especially if you have an ADHD diagnosis, um, are more likely to have wide attention just generally. And there are reasons for that. And we can't ever know. We can come up with theories. And of course, we have plenty. But answering the question of why, let me put it this way. You can never fully answer the question of why anything. You can you can arrive at conclusions and say like, this is definitely a part of it, or maybe even this is a huge part of it, right? Like if I tip over my glass, I can say that glass fell over because I knocked it over. But of course there's other data involved too, the amount of water that was in the glass and what exactly gravity, blah, blah, blah. It's just not relevant because this was the part that made the distinction, right? So the why, analysis, including psychology, is useful in that it can allow us either to change what we want to become more in line with what is, change what is to become more in line with what we want, or just decrease our awareness of a thing. Why do I always blank, 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 blank? Why? I hate it. I hate it. I hate that I do this. Why do I always do this? And if I can say, well, you're doing it because as a child, you experienced X, Y, and Z, and as a natural psychological response to that, you, you know, blah, blah, blah. If that makes sense to you, if your brain buys it, then it says, ah, okay. Maybe that enables you to change what you want or change what is. Or maybe it's just like, okay, now I know why. And now I don't have to worry about it anymore because 
there's nothing I can do about it. Some people do use diagnosis in that way, right? Like there's nothing that can be done. This is how it is. Now I don't have to pay attention. It'll still cause me problems, but when it's not actively causing me a problem, I don't have to think about it. Um, so like, just to follow up with this one is like, this goes like, like the, you know, uh, sensitivities and everything else is if there's like these black hole distractions, um, I give myself enough, all like, quote, like good distractions. Like I have music playing all the time, but it's oftentimes like when I'm working, it's all music that I'm familiar with. So it's not new music, but it's also, there's a lot of it. So it varies through that, but I don't have to really pay attention to it. I just have fidgets there. I have my desk set up and I was like a boring wall, but then I have my window, my puppy sits right over there. So these are things that like are like engaging, but like they're not distracting, but they also are distractions. So I'm noticing them, but they're not taking up. They're not like, oh, look they're at that. They're attention, but not awareness. Yeah, there yeah. we go. This is the term. So when we were talking about um, stimming and fidgeting, you know, goes into this category. Things that take up attention, but are non-problematic, are not novel, you know, they're routine, they're something you already understand. So it comes into awareness, but then almost immediately is dismissed. So yeah, stims and fidgets, things like that um, will definitely help you to pay less attention to other things. As far as hyper-focus, we don't really have time to get into that today, but that's, mm -hmm. that is kind of intrinsically linked as a flip side to the wide attention is the ability to, at times, when it is necessary, when it is urgent, focus everything on a task, right? The flip side of, I procrastinate my paper until the last minute is, and then I sit down and do nothing but my paper for four hours or whatever it is. Yeah. But you have to be able to do both, you know, to do one, you have to be able to do the other because there is an intrinsic desire to avoid failure, you know, whatever you, what you want to call it. Like if, if I procrastinate, 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 and then never actually do it, then pretty soon that's not going to be procrastination anymore. Pretty soon I'm not going to say, oh, I'm putting it off, but I'm still going to have to do it. This is, it's just going to change to be like, oh yeah, I'm not going to do that. Then. The brain can't maintain that forever. You know, like sooner or later I'll be like, yeah, I'm not going to do that thing. It's not worth paying attention to instead of, yeah, I'm not going to do that thing. And it's a huge problem. Because if you're thinking of it in that way, you will engage with it at some point. What exactly you do, who knows? Yeah. Now, hyperfocus isn't always necessary, especially when we're talking about sensitivities, right? Hyperfocus can be used when it's necessary, but we develop these pathways and patterns and whatever in response to things that we, you know, that that are important, but then we use them even when they're not. You know what I mean? Like you could say the same thing about wide focus is that there are times when that is great. When I'm in a novel situation, a place where I don't have previous reference and understanding of everything that's here, it's really useful for me to be able to scan many things quickly and make quick snap judgments about what things are valuable and what are not. Yeah, sure. I only got one or two pieces of data about it, but that's enough for me to identify. I'll need. Or even running plans and scenarios. What about this? No, that won't work. What about this? No, that won't work. And I quit them all very quickly until I've that's very useful, but then there are circumstances in which it's not useful and then we still do it anyway, because the body and the brain, they, they do what they do. You know, like if you do something a million times, then the a million and first time that you're, you know, exposed to the same stimuli, you're probably going to do the same thing. It will take more effort to do something else. Yeah. So there's both. It's just that there's not a lot in between. I don't know. I don't know about that. I, I don't know that I would say that there's not a lot in between. I definitely would say that we are more likely to notice the state of hyperfocus or the state of like widely distracted, that when things are more in the middle, we just don't notice it and remember it as much. And I think obviously there's variation from person to person and context to context about which things happen with what frequency. But I don't think that I could say that certain people, you know, only are wide or narrow like we we have mediums you know like i can track four different conversations if i need to you know but still have enough data about each one to actually track them it's kind of what we're doing right now right between the chat and this and all that kind of yeah but but again our our concept of ourselves in reality is shaped by what we notice and what we remember so if all you remember because remember that's geared towards problematic data or solution data yeah, you're more likely to notice being distracted or being hyper-focused than 
to notice your happy medium. So as time goes on, you're just going to think, man, I'm always either hyper-focused or super distracted. It's like you probably have lots of memories of when you were very hot or very cold. But if I ask you to at, you know, give me memories of when you were a very comfortable temperature, it's like, Ooh, uh, yeah. I don't know, probably most of the, you know, like you can recreate it, but you don't actually have memories. Anyway, I got to run. I got a client. Yep. So on that note, uh, thank you guys again for uh, joining us here at This Is Not Therapy Hour. We will be here. Um, Good to be sign with off you. Because we've got a session. Um, we'll be back next Wednesday, 1 p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time. Uh, well, just me going on the big screen like without Brendan there makes you feel like, whoa, it distracted me. So, um, but yeah, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for all the chats um, and everything else. Uh, you guys have a wonderful week.